Can we just across the room this morning, can I just invite you to just to lift your hands, just to lift your hands out this morning, just in a posture of receiving from the Spirit what He has for us, in a posture of surrender, posture of receiving. He has us here for a reason, to speak to us, to minister to us, to take us from one point to the next. And so we want to receive what he has for us in this house today. So just pray with me with your hands lifted. Father, we thank you that you are the God of revival, the God that brings dead thing back to life, the God that breathes life into lungs that aren't breathing you breathe your life into us and we start to breathe again we come back to life God you've resurrected us and so God today we position ourselves in a posture of surrender and a posture of receiving from you what you have for us would you pour out your spirit on this place today would you pour out your spirit on us God we receive from you what you have for us in faith, we receive it. As your word comes forward, God, would it not be my words, God, would it be your words as we receive what you have for us today? Let your spirit move. Let your spirit move. And may we be different when we leave this place today. Thank you that you're here, God. Would you wake us up? Would you wake us up to your goodness? Would you wake us up to your grace? Would you wake us up to your love? Whatever it is that we need to hear today, God, would you speak to us? We ask you, we beg you, we receive from you what you have for us. Would you move in this place? We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We love you, Jesus. This is all for you. Amen. All God's people said, amen. We glad you're at church today. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys take a seat. You guys take a seat. Can we give it up for this team for leading us so well? Man, they're awesome. They're awesome. I'm excited about what God's going to do in the house today. I'm really excited about what he is already doing <laughs> as we've been singing, as we've been praising, as we've been worshiping, man, it refreshes my soul. I don't know about you, but it refreshes my soul to come in here every Sunday and just give praise to God for what he's doing. Amen? Anybody else glad that we can do that each and every week, just start off our week in the house of God? Man. It's just, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. If you're joining us online, thank you for tuning in today. I'm excited about what God has. I asked Pastor Richie several weeks ago when we were talking about schedules and what we were going to do this week. I, I called him one day and I just said, hey, would you mind if I did one more message in our Living in the Spirit series that we started at the beginning of the year, and I gave him a rundown. I said, God showed me this back in the fall, and I believe that he wants me to share it, so would you mind if we did one more week in living in the Spirit? And he said, that sounds great. Let's do it. And so um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do one more message in living in the Spirit. I think a little bit more Spirit's always a good thing, right? And so a little bit more Spirit, so we got one more message, and then we're going to start a new series next week that you'll hear a little bit more about in a little bit. But Pastor Richie, he's off today, obviously. He's getting some rest. He and uh, Mrs. Kim, they went to see some family this past week, so glad they could have some time off and be able to see some family and relax. And so uh, they will be back with us next week. But today, we're going to be doing one more message in Living in the Spirit. So I'm excited about what God has for us and if you're new here, maybe this is your first week here, or maybe you are been gone for a while, maybe you haven't been here in 2020, first off, shame on you, you know, but no. But if, you, if you're new here, if you have been away for a little while, we started a series called Living in the Spirit, talking about what it means to walk in the Spirit, what it means to live in the Spirit, what is this thing we refer to as the Spirit or the Holy Spirit, and 
Pastor Richie's been walking us through that. But I don't know about you, but I've been feeling, been feeling God move in our church. I've been feeling him move in our church, in our people, in our staff. We talk about it all the time, how we just feel like God's taking us to new levels of what it means to live in the spirit and to walk in the spirit. And I hear stories week in and week out of how God's moving and he's speaking and he's revealing things to people, how he's making them more aware of his presence, how, how he's answering prayers, how he's strengthening our faith. And we could just go on and on and on about how God is waking us up to what it means to walk in the spirit. And I believe this, I believe this, I believe we are on the verge of an awakening, of an awakening in the church. And I don't just mean that we're on the verge of an awakening here at Avalon Church, I believe that's a part of it, but I believe as the church, we are on the verge of seeing God do something like he hasn't done in a long time in the church. Because we just came out of this crazy year called 2020. And I think a lot of people, especially in the church world, they look at 2020 and they, make, they, they say, man, this is such a, such a letdown. This was such a bummer. We didn't get to do all the things that we thought we were going to do. Our calendar just got blown up. And a lot of people would look at it and be like, man, 2020 was a setback, but I believe it's the opposite. I believe 2020 was not a setback, but I believe it was a setup for what's to come in our church, in our people, in our families. I believe this, a lot of things got stripped away in 2020. A lot of priorities changed and they're still that way today. And some things are not gonna go back to normal. They're not gonna go back to the way they were. A lot of things have been stripped away. A lot of things that we had become so dependent on are now no longer there. And so a lot of people are pressing in to the Lord. They're pressing into what it means to be close to his spirit, what it means to walk in the spirit, because now we've made room. We've had a lot of things stripped away. Now we have room and capacity to say, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't have any control anymore. I need you to step in and I need you to move. And a lot of people are stepping into what it means to walk in the spirit. And I think we're going to see change happen. I believe we're gonna see change happen. See, change doesn't happen because a certain person gets elected into the White House. Change doesn't come by laws that are passed. Change doesn't come by politicians that are placed into positions. Change happens when the body of Christ starts to look like the body of Christ and starts to live in the power of the Spirit. That's when change happens. Can I get an amen? That's when change happens. And so we start living in the power of the Spirit. We look at, look at the early church. If you think about the Bible, if you think about in the book of Acts, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he, he told his disciples, he's looking down at them, and an awesome last message, a last you know, statement before he ascends into heaven, he looks down and he says, after this, you will receive what? Power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And then Jesus leaves, and the disciples go back, and they wait, and the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, and over 3,000 people are saved at, at first, and then it says that the Lord added to their number daily. He added to their number daily, and so they, they figured out, and they found out what it means to walk and be in the power of the Spirit. So how do we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we want to talk about today. We've, we've talked this whole series about what it means to live in the Spirit, and I want us to leave it today talking about how to leave it walking in the power of the Spirit. So today, our message is called Activate the Power. Activate the Power. That's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to be in Luke chapter Four. So if you've got your Bible here today, or if you've got your phone, y'all can go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 4. 
Luke chapter four. How many people got a Bible in the house? Can we just see, can we just see some, some hands? How, and there's some people that they've got a Bible in their hands, it's called a phone, and right now it's on Facebook and it needs to get taken over to the Bible app so we can follow along with what God has for us in his word today. And so today we wanna look at Luke chapter four. So let's get on over there. I've got a lot I wanna point out in these few verses. And this is a fairly well-known story in Jesus's life. He's starting out his earthly ministry and he goes into the wilderness. This is the story of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And so that's what we wanna look at today. And we're gonna walk through this passage. We're not gonna read the, the entirety of it, but we're gonna start in verse one. And it says this, so if you've got your Bible, get ready, here we go. It's gonna be good, it's gonna be good. God, God showed me this. I've read this story so many times. I've heard this story my whole life. I grew up in church. But when I was reading this back in the fall, I noticed something that I'd never noticed before. And I think the crazy thing about God, the, the amazing thing about him is when we're in his word is, you know, obviously his word, it's alive, it's active, it's moving, it's always speaking. And I believe God sometimes holds something back until you really need it. And for such a time as this, God showed me this and I was just blown away and I knew he's gonna want me to share it and so I'm excited that we get to look at it today. So in verse one of Luke chapter four, it says this. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So here's Jesus, he's full of the Spirit. If you have the ability to highlight or underline, I want you to underline or highlight full of the Spirit. Full of the Spirit, that's in verse one. So Jesus is going into the wilderness, he's full of the Spirit, all right? And so now let's skip on ahead. The end of our passage is Luke chapter four, verse 14, and it says this. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. You read that again. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So verse one, he was full of the Spirit. Verse 14, he's in the power of the Spirit. And when I read that, I read this passage and I was like, I got to verse 14 and I read Jesus return to Galilee and the power of the Spirit. And I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, that word power is different than what we read a minute ago. And so I, I went back up to verse one and I said, oh, he went in full of the Spirit, but he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. There's a difference. So how can we, as followers of Jesus, how can we get from verse one to verse 14? That's what we wanna to tackle today. How can we get from verse one to verse 14? How can we go from being full of the Spirit to being empowered by the Spirit? How do we activate the Spirit in our lives? Are we ready? Are we ready this morning? Are we alive? We wanna see what it means to activate the power of the Spirit. God, would you give us clarity today? God, would you speak to us would you show us in your words something we've never seen before, God? Would these be words that you want said, not the words that I've prepared, but God, would you speak like you want to do right now? God, would you use me to deliver this in the best possible way so that your people can leave here in the power of the Spirit? God, would you move in this time? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many ever got a new debit card in the mail? How many ever, that's a stupid question, right? That's a stupid question. Who does not have, who does not have a debit card? I've got to, give me a second, I've got to open this. It was fighting me. It wasn't letting me do it. I don't have that power of the spirit yet. I can't open the water. And so, and we got it open. So how many people, you got a new debit card in the mail, right? Either you've lost it, either it snapped in half, or maybe your expiration date passed. So you get a new debit card in the mail. When you open up the envelope, you get the new card, and what do you see on the card? What's on the card? Right when you get it in the mail, it's got a little sticker on it, right? That says, please call this number 
our go-to, now that we live in the new age, we can go online and we can activate it that way. It has a sticker that says, please call this number or please go to this web address and to activate the card. Because it doesn't matter whether you've got $20 in your bank account or whether you've got $20,000 in your bank account. Until you call that number, until you go through the proper steps, you don't have access to those funds. You have to activate the card in order to get access to what's on the other end. And just like your bank account, we as believers in Jesus, we as followers of Christ, we are full of the Holy Spirit. But unless we go through the proper process, we will not have access to the full power of the Spirit. And so today we want to look at what is that process like? What does it take to activate the power, just like we need to activate that debit card so we can go out and spend more money. We want to activate the power of the Spirit. And so as we look here in Luke 4, I believe the first thing we want to see is actually in the chapter before Luke chapter 4. This is sort of like the, the prequel. This is sort of the, what comes before Jesus gets to the wilderness. Because when I was reading and when I was studying Notice in verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And so when I read that, I said, well, now he's full of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's leading him. And when we're being led, that means we're going from one point to another and so he's headed in a direction. So it, it, I asked myself the question, I'm like, well, where is he being led from? And so if we're in chapter four, <laughs> if we're being led from somewhere, then it makes sense we would go to chapter three, right? To see if maybe, maybe the answer's in chapter three. And so if we flip over to Luke chapter three, we're gonna see where Jesus is starting his earthly ministry. He was born, right? He was born as a baby. He was born of a virgin. And then we see him in the temple when he's 12. And then he sort of disappears off the scene until he's 30 years old. And and the next time we see him after we see him in the temple when he's 12 years old is right here in Luke chapter 3. And John the Baptist is baptizing people. He's calling people to repent of their sins, saying there's a Messiah coming. And lo and behold, Jesus shows up on the scene here in Luke chapter 3. And we find him there, and he's being baptized. And so he's at the start of his earthly ministry, and Jesus is being baptized. So let's look in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. It says this. It says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. And it said this. It said, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And so here we see the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends on him. And then a voice comes from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And this whole passage, we could speak a whole nother message just on this passage. But there are two things that happen here in this passage. Let's put the verse back up there. And we'll see these two things that happen in this passage. And I, I think we have to get a grip on this before we can move forward and follow the Spirit into the wilderness and read what happened to Jesus there. We have to understand this first. Because if we don't have a grip on what happened here, then the wilderness is going to destroy us. The will, this is our foundation. This, we have to get this first. We have to get this first. And I believe that's why this happened first in Jesus' life. We have to understand who we are and what we have. And so the two things that happen here in this passage is the Holy Spirit is given to Jesus. And then God speaks his approval over him. Those are the two things that happen right here. God gives the Holy Spirit and then he gives his approval. And we need to understand that we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit within us. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's no price you can pay to buy it. It is given as a gift from 
God. When you receive Jesus as your savior, when you commit your life to him, when you receive what he did on the cross for you and you believe that he died for your sins and that he rose again on the third day, when you say, Jesus, I believe and I give you my life, I surrender my life to you, I'm gonna live for you, one thing happens and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. The Holy Spirit comes and fills you. And scripture's clear on this. We see a couple of verses just for us in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Another verse in 1 Corinthians and in chapter two, verse 12 says, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. We have the spirit within us. We have the spirit within us. If you are a believer in Jesus, you have the spirit in you. That's the first thing we need to understand. Just like Jesus, he was baptized and then the Holy Spirit descended on him. When you receive Jesus as your savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. And the second thing that happens here is that God gives his approval. So the Holy Spirit came on Jesus and then the heavens are open and a voice comes down and it says, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. And I, I, I remember the first time I sort of understood what was happening here. I had a mentor of mine walking, it, walking me through where my true identity was. My identity is not in the things that I do. The, my identity is not in my accomplishments. My identity comes from God and who he says I am. And notice where this happens. This is the first thing we see Jesus do at the outset of his ministry. He goes to get baptized and before he does anything, before he forgives sins, before he turns water into wine, before he heals the first blind person, before he tells the man to pick up and take his mat and to walk, before he does anything, God looks at him and he says, you are my son and in you I am well pleased and I love you. There is nothing Jesus had to do first. God said, no, I love you first before you do anything and some of you today, you need to hear that because you've been striving your whole life to earn the approval of those that are around you. Maybe it's a father you've tried so hard to earn his approval, or maybe it's a spouse that you're trying so hard to impress. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's something you're trying to attain at work, and you're trying so hard to have somebody tell you uh, how worthy you are, how much you are valued, but God is saying, I don't care about the things that you do. It doesn't matter how good you you are. What matters is how good I am. And it is nothing you can do to earn my approval. I love you. You are my son. So somebody here today, either in the room or watching online, needs to hear that you are my son. You are my daughter. And I love you. And with you, I am well pleased. Someone needs to hear that today. And here's the thing. If you don't understand who you are in God, then we don't need to go any further. Because the moment we step into where the Spirit was leading Jesus from here, he needed to know this. Because the wilderness will destroy you. If you don't know who you are and what you have inside of you, the wilderness is going to destroy you. It's going to wreck your world. But this is the foundation this is the foundation, and this is why I thought it was so crucial. Before we dive into what happened to Jesus in the wilderness, we need to understand first who we are and what we have. So each and every one of us need to know who you are. That's step one. Jesus knew who he was because God told him. And today, so someone needs to hear God, tell them, I love you. You've tried your whole life to measure up. You've tried your whole life to earn my love or earn the love of those that are around you, but that doesn't matter because I love you. 
We need to go from working for approval to working from it. We need to go from working for approval to working from it. And you have to know who you are. Because if we're going to go any further, we have to know that. We have to know it. We have to believe it. And so Jesus knows who he is. He knows who he is. He's heard the Father speak. He's had the Holy Spirit come upon him. And Scripture says in another book, I can't remember if it's Matthew or Mark, but it says that Jesus immediately leaves the Jordan and the Spirit leads him to the wilderness. And so after he hears the Father speak his identity over him, tell him that he loves them and he fills them with the Spirit, Jesus submits to the Spirit's leading in our lives. So not only do we need to know who we are, we need to follow the Spirit. That's the second thing we see today. We need to follow the Spirit. Let's keep reading back in Luke chapter 4. Let's keep reading back in Luke chapter 4. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. And what do we, what do we know about the wilderness? What do we know about the wilderness? Well, the wilderness is a place of testing. The wilderness is a place of testing. It isn't pleasant, it isn't easy, and it's uncomfortable, right? The wilderness is uncomfortable, but sometimes we're led into the uncomfortable. Sometimes we're led into the uncomfortable. And a lot of you are probably sitting here and you're wondering, well, why is it that the Spirit keeps leading me into these places? Why is it that it seems that I'm always battling and always struggling and always being put to the test? Why is my faith always being stretched? Why, why is it that I have to keep walking through this? And so can I just suggest for each and every one of us, because I do this myself when we're walking through the thick of it, we're wondering, why does this keep happening to me? So can I just suggest a, a change of perspective today on the wilderness? Can I just suggest a little switch in our perspective of what the wilderness really represents? Can we say and, and, and declare, instead of looking at the wilderness as something to avoid, can we look at it as something to accept? Can we do that together? And I know that's tough and that's not easy, but can we look at the wilderness, wilderness not as something to avoid? And if we're going through life and we see a wilderness coming up ahead, or maybe we step into it and we're like, man, how quickly can I just get out of here? Can I just put my head down and just kind of plow through and get through this? But no, can we not look at, at it as something to avoid, but as something to accept? And don't don't misunderstand me today. When I say we need to accept it, that doesn't mean we need to enjoy it. <laughs> That's important to understand. I'm not saying we need to have a change of perspective and we need to enjoy the wilderness. I'm sure Jesus didn't enjoy the wilderness, but he sure did appreciate it. He sure did appreciate it. He sure did know that he needed it. And I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily enjoy the gym, right? Now, there's some weirdos out there. There's some of you that are in here, and you love the gym. I don't get it. You're weird. You're weird, and you can get out. But uh, some of us don't enjoy the gym, but one thing that we do is we do appreciate, we do appreciate the results of the gym, right? And some of us need to get back in the gym. And I'm preaching to myself right there so we can appreciate it a little bit more. But just because we need to appreciate something or see the value in it doesn't necessarily mean you have to enjoy it. That's not what I'm saying. You know, kids don't enjoy being disciplined, right? But when they get older, when they get older and have kids of their own, they do appreciate what mom and dad did for them when they were young, right? I know I think a lot of times and I appreciate the whoopings I got, right? And so because it made me who I am today, but I didn't enjoy it. You're weird if you enjoy that. You're weird if you enjoy that. So, but we do appreciate, we do appreciate it. I, I hated school. I hated tests. 
You know, students don't like tests, but when you're older and you know how to add two plus two and it equals four, you sure do appreciate the education that you have, right? You do appreciate it. And so can I just suggest that we change our perspective today on the wilderness when we go through these seasons of testing and these tough times that we don't try to avoid it, but we accept it and we appreciate it for what it's doing for us. And a lot of us, we find ourselves in wilderness experiences throughout our life. And if you're not in one right now, can I just say, get ready? Because it's coming. You know, maybe you're like, man, my life is great. My life is great. I'm on top of the mountain. I'm on top of the mountain. And I'm just shouting for joy because my life couldn't be any better. But you know what's on the other side of the mountain? Is a decline, is a valley, is a wilderness. So at some point, you're going to come back down, and you're going to need this. You're going to need this. And so, but maybe some of you find yourself in the wilderness today. Maybe some of you, especially those of you that are joining us online, maybe you're in a wilderness of depression and anxiety and fear just because of everything that's going on in the world today. Maybe for the last 10 months, you've been shut up in your house, and you feel like there's no end in sight. You feel like there's no end coming and you're walking through the wilderness, can I just say that God has something he's trying to do in your life. He's trying to do something in our lives. He doesn't walk us through these seasons for no reason. Now, God doesn't always cause the things that happen to us to happen, but he sure does use them to make us stronger. He sure does use them to prepare us for what he has for us in the future. And so Jesus understood this. And he submitted to the Holy Spirit and he willfully went to the wilderness and he willfully went there because he knew in the wilderness, that's where I'm strongest. I know a lot of you are probably maybe a little confused by that because you're like, man, I walk through the wilderness and I feel like I'm trash. And I feel like I'm at my weakest. I'm at my most vulnerable state when I'm in the wilderness. And Jesus knew that when I go to the wilderness, that's where I'm strongest. And you know why he was strong in the wilderness? It's because he was dependent on his father. And so today, when you go through the wilderness, it's not, hey, I'm strong because I have what it takes. No, you're strong because the one that's with you has what it takes. And in the wilderness, you're dependent on your father. See, we have to admit that we can't do it on our own. We have to yield control of our circumstances and God knows that if we're going to be effective and learn what it means to live in the power of the Spirit, we have to become dependent on him. We have to be dependent on him. So here's Jesus surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and he follows the Spirit into the wilderness because he knows that's what he needs so let's keep reading. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. No joke. No joke. 40 days and 40 nights, nothing to eat. Yeah, he's hungry. Yeah, he's hungry. And I believe that's important. Those, those few words are very important because he identifies with you and with me and each and every one of us. Jesus was hungry. He was physically hungry. But here's what he did. Jesus is in the wilderness and he's giving up his earthly food for heavenly fulfillment. He's gone into the wilderness and he's saying, I'm stripping everything away so I can become more dependent on my father. So I can hear from him and hear what he has for me so that he can stretch me, so that he can grow me, so he can prepare me for the ministry that he has for me, for the mission that's ahead. I need God, my father, to run me through the ringer. I need him to take me to the gym. I need him to stretch me. I need him to grow me. I need him to exercise me so I'll be ready for what is 
ahead. And as he's there, look who comes along. The devil. The devil comes along. And he sees Jesus. And it says that he tempted him all throughout the 40 days. And so I believe that these, these last three are at the end. And scripture says this. It's at the end of this season of just temptation after temptation after beating after beating from the devil. For 40 days, Jesus has been there. He's not eating anything. And he's hangry. And he's just getting pounded by the devil. And so here's Jesus at the end of his time in the wilderness. And here comes the devil. And he says, look. And I just see him kind of like nudging his demon pals. You know, he's kind of nudging them on the side. He says, look, I got him now. I got him now. He's weak. He's vulnerable. He's broken. He's at his lowest state. And I got him. But here's the thing. Jesus is sitting there saying, bring it. Bring it. Because on the outside, it looks like I'm weak. On the outside, it looks like I'm vulnerable. On the outside, it looks like I'm broken. But on the inside, I'm strong. On the inside, I'm full. Because I got my father right here with me. I got my father right here. Physically, it looks like I'm starving. But spiritually, I'm strong. Spiritually, I'm satisfied. And so when the devil comes at you, you need to know that the Father is what's filling you up. That's where your strength comes from. Your strength doesn't come with how strong you are. Your strength comes because of how strong he is. And so Jesus looks at the devil and says, bring it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Bring it. Bring it. And so the devil comes to him and he throws a temptation at him. He says this in verse three, he says, if you are the son of God, look how he's questioning what Jesus just found out back in chapter three. If you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And if you look at, if you study the wilderness that Jesus is in, it's not a typical wilderness that you would think that's just full of sand. The wilderness is full of limestone and these little rocks that actually really do look like little loaves of bread. And so here's Jesus in the wilderness. He's tired. He's hungry. He's not really feeling too strong at the moment. And all around him are these little snippets of satisfaction just surrounding him. All these little rocks that look like loaves of bread. And he's got the power. He's got the ability to look at each and every one of them and turn them into bread. But he knew that's not what truly satisfies. What the devil was doing here was throwing him a shortcut. He was throwing him a shortcut. And so when we go through the wilderness, the third thing we need to do is don't settle for shortcuts. Don't settle for shortcuts. Don't settle. Don't settle. I think sometimes when we're in the midst of the wilderness, when we're being broken down, we try so hard to numb the pain of what's going on around us with everything and anything that's around us that will just satisfy the moment. That'll just satisfy us for a moment. Don't settle for shortcuts. There's a lot of us here today that the devil has going around munching on rocks, thinking that's what truly satisfies when what truly satisfies, what truly satisfies is what Jesus tells the devil after he tempts him with turning the stone into bread. He, Jesus quotes scripture right here from Deuteronomy. And he says, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Jesus knew it's not these rocks that satisfy. <laughs> yeah, it might feel good. It might feel good for a moment, but that's gonna be fleeting, it's gonna go away. But what truly satisfies is everything that comes from God. Every word that he speaks, 
And so with this first temptation, Jesus sets the tempo for all the other temptations are, that are to come. The devil comes back again and he comes back one last time. And each and every time, Jesus throws scripture right back at the devil. Jesus exercises the power that we find in God's word. And that's the last thing we do when we're in the wilderness is we need to exercise the power. We need to exercise the power of God's word. And you know, the only way to really get good at something is to practice, right? The only way to get good at something is to practice and to exercise. You just need to start doing it. And it says this, it says in, in verse 13, it says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The devil left him. So Jesus defeated Satan with scripture. You see, the devil's not gonna exhaust himself on a battle he can't win. He's not gonna exhaust himself on an ineffective battle. And so he left him. I mean, the book of James tells us to submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And there are some of you today that just wonder, why is it that the devil just keeps coming at me and coming at me? And he won't leave me alone. He just comes back with the same old thing and the same old thing time after time. If you want the devil to leave you alone, start resisting. Start resisting. Stop listening to him. I think the first mistake we make so many times when the devil starts to tempt us if we, is we listen. <laughs> we start to pay attention. And if we start paying attention, man, it's almost like that hook when it goes in the fish's mouth, it's, it's there. He's got a foothold on us at that point. Stop listening. Start resisting. And maybe the reason you're attacked so much is because you resist so little. Maybe the devil keeps coming back because you're easy prey. Start resisting. Start depending on your father. Start quoting scripture back at him. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. So we have to follow where the spirit leads in order to activate the power that's inside of us. And like Jesus, we want to go from verse 1 to verse 14. We want to go from being full of the spirit to being in the power of the spirit. We want to go from being full to powerful. We go from being full to powerful. That's what we want to do, and we do that. Let me just summarize kind of where we've been, because I know I've hit a lot of things, but we need to know who we are, and we need to know who is inside of us. Secondly, we need to follow the Spirit. We need to follow the Spirit no matter where He leads us. If He leads us into the wilderness, we follow. If He leads us into good times, we follow. We stay true. We stay submitted. Thirdly, we need to not settle for shortcuts. Stop settling for shortcuts. And lastly, we need to exercise the power of God's word. Exercise the power of God's word. If we do that, we'll start to activate the power that's within us. We all have the spirit. We're all full of the spirit, but we want to activate it and live a life that is in the power of the spirit. Let me just read one last scripture and I'm going to turn it over to our team. It says this in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He is talking about a thorn that's in his side, a thorn that's in his flesh that just won't seem to go away. And, and he doesn't, scripture doesn't tell us exactly what this is necessarily. And I think that's on purpose. It's so that we can all identify with what's going on with Paul. And he had this thorn in his flesh that just wouldn't seem to go away, whether it was a, a sin struggle, whether it was a person or a relationship or what it was, we don't know. But he says this, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect <laughs> in weakness Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in the wilderness. My power is made perfect in the struggle, in the hospital room, in self-isolation, in anxiety, in fear, in the hard times. My power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul says, I will delight in my weaknesses. If delighting in my weakness brings power, then so be it. I'll delight, I'll celebrate, I'll proclaim my weaknesses because that declares how great God is. And the weaker I am, the weaker I am, the greater God is. The greater he is because his power is made perfect in weakness. And so activate the power. When you go through the wilderness, don't try to escape it, but embrace it. Embrace it. Let God change you. Because it's in our weakness that his power is made perfect. It's in our weakness that his power is made perfect. Father, we thank you today that your power is made perfect in our weakness. We thank you that when we walk through the wilderness, you have declared our identity over us. You've told us who we are and what we have. We thank you that your spirit leads us. God, would you help us not to settle for shortcuts, but God, would you help us to exercise the power that's found in your word so when we walk through tough times, when we walk through the wilderness, we can live a life full of the Spirit, live a life that's full of the power of the Spirit. God, would you do that for us today? Because when we are weak, you are strong. God, would you show us your glory today? Would you show us your glory today? May your power be made perfect in our weakness. All around the room, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to turn this over to our team. Let's just sing. Let's just proclaim today. Let's proclaim today that when we are weak, he is strong. When we are weak, he is strong. Can you just say that? When we are weak, he is strong. When we are weak, he is strong. When we are weak, he is strong. God, would your power be made perfect in our weakness today? Would you be made perfect in our weakness today? Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.